why I wanted to show you that video. What did you notice? There's a few people yelling, run, run, run. What did you notice about the people just standing there? You noticed that they were just, they were in their bikinis, they had their lunch boxes, they had their kids, they had their lawn chairs. Notice they were just completely unaware of what was coming. They're sitting out there, and to them, the 30 seconds before the realization of what's happening and the 30 seconds after the realization, entirely different. And they're sitting there, and they can see this thing coming, but they have no concept. The guy in the red shorts right there, the last guy you saw at the end, the guy in the red shorts, he's just standing there looking at this thing. I don't know if he's overwhelmed. I don't know if his brain, if, the, you know, if, the, if he's short-circuited at this point and doesn't have a clue what's going on. Um, but you see him just standing there. There's no running. There's no terror. He's not screaming. He just gets overwhelmed. And what you don't realize is none of those people in that video are alive today. Not a single soul of any of those people who were on that beach would have survived. That was a 32, 32 foot tall. Every single one of those within seconds of you seeing them were wiped out. Dead. Gone. And as I was watching that video, something struck. Is that not just like the right this minute? There are some of us who are yelling, Ross, as fast as you can get there. Get to the point of quick. Go, 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 go. There's a world full of people out there who are standing on the beach. And they're looking. Some of them are completely unaware. They have no idea what's coming. They have no idea what's about to overtake them. They have no concept of any kind of destruction. They are completely unaware. And even if they cast their eye over their shoulder and they see it way out there, they don't even have enough sense to be afraid. Those people there didn't even have enough sense to be afraid because they had so little understanding of what was coming. Had no knowledge of what was coming. They knew there had been an earthquake. They knew there had been a little bit of shaking. But that had been hours before. So they had no idea. They were just, life was going on. Everything was good. They were marrying and giving in marriage. They were eating. They were drinking. They were enjoying life. And all of a sudden, this overwhelming swell overtakes them to their death. And I'll ask you again, is that not so much like the rapture? As you're sitting there and you're watching that destruction sweep down, can you imagine that there is coming a day when there is a trumpet that is going to sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then those of us who remain will be caught up in the air to meet Him in the clouds and every single person that is not saved by the blood of Jesus does not call out upon His name. Every single one of them is going to be swept away by a tsunami of evil called the tribulation that is going to wash across the surface of this earth with a power and a strength and a destruction that has never been witnessed on this planet before so think about that little boy in those standing there entirely unaware the reason I wanted to show this and the reason I wanted to bring this up tonight is there'll be a lot of you are asking this question why have you become so why have you become sir and the face of the father and the power of the father and the present father why have you become sick with the moving power of his presence why have you become so overtaken by that why are you pushing us for it why do you want us to come up on Sunday morning and seek his face why are you pushing us for this kind of worship why are you continually talking about it why are you continually pushing us into it and I'm going to tell you why because there is a world full of red shorted little boys standing on the sides of the beach of this life and there is a wave that is going to overwhelm them and overtake them and they're going to be utterly destroyed and lost for all eternity and they're going to be swept into a hell that was only designed for Satan and his imps that's all it was designed for and they're going there by the thousands and the thousands and I look in the book of Genesis and into Exodus and I find a man named Moses who walked into the court of a man named Pharaoh And he walked in with word and he said back his word, let my children go. And Pharaoh chuckled under his voice, I do not know the God you speak of. I don't have a clue who you're talking about. Moses, you're so full of yourself. What are you even doing here? And Moses, carrying a staff within his hand, threw a staff down upon the ground and that staff became a snake. Moses Pharaoh chuckled. He called together his own sorcerers. His own sorcerers walked up and they threw down staffs that turned into snakes. 
Moses never moved. The staff of Moses, the true representation of the true glory of God, walled over, slithered over to those other two snakes and took them by the head and swallowed them in their wholeness and in their entirety. It went to the first one and swallowed it completely. It went to the second one and swallowed it completely. It crawled its way back over to the foot of Moses. Moses bent over and picked that thing up and it instantaneously returned itself back into a staff in the hand of Moses. And Moses pointed his finger at Pharaoh and said, Let my children go. And I'm going to tell you, in these last days, evil is going to walk up in all kinds of power. They have the ability to do incantations. They have the ability to perform what seems to be miracles. They are even going to have the ability during the tribulation to call fire down from heaven. But I am here to tell you today that there is no darkness that can stand against the true power of the true glory of the living God. And if the glory of God shines in this place, in its full and its power every single lost person that sees it it will be a sign to them as it was when the staff of Moses devoured the staff of the snakes of those just doing incantations it will be a power that they will not be able to deny and they'll never stand on the beach of life again and see a wave coming in and say I did not know and I had no understanding that's why that I want to see the power of God why do I want to see the power of God move in such a fashion that people are slain in the spirit, that the spirit of the living God moves and people are changed because in his presence they will be healed, they will be rescued, they will be delivered, they will be set free, their lives will be absolutely changed where in witchcraft and incantations and the works of the flesh, all they will do is feel better for a moment and go home. But in the grace and the power and the strength of God, they will bump into something that you can't you can't get it off your hand, get it out of your mind. You can't be a touch that you give. That is why I keep calling. We put our heart and our minds together in one mind and one accord within ourselves. That whatever the cost, whatever the price, whatever it takes, however many days, however many prayers, however many tears, however many cries, however many shouts, however many times we have to do it, that it takes for the power of God to fall in this place like it did when it did not consume the bush, but burn the bush in front of Moses so be it whatever the cost whatever it takes however long it takes why because there's a world full of red shorted little boys dying and they have no concept of what is coming but in the name of Jesus fullness of the power of the word and then it being demonstrated by the grace of God they so that's why we're going to face it that's why we're going to pursue it that's why we are going to continue his face that's why we're going it's never too late that's exactly right. So, anyway, I just, that's the reason. I really hope that that video haunts you for, I really hope that little boy in those red shorts wakes you up in the middle of the night tonight. I really hope that those families standing there with those kids looking out at that wave invade your consciousness for two And when it wakes you up in the middle of the night and you see that wave coming in, I hope you see printed across it the word rapture. Rapture. Because I think it's coming. I think we need to be about intentionally not. We've got to get to Jacob. So I'm going to give you the Kip tonight. Are y'all ready for that? How many of you read Genesis chapter 25, uh, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33? Anita, thank you that you read. That's a lot of reading. So I know. I know I gave you a lot, a lot of reading. I actually asked you to read this story thinking that one time thinking that you were Isaac, one time thinking you were Rebecca, one time thinking you were Esau, and one time thinking you were Jacob. Now, most of you know this story a little bit, if at least. Uh, there was a guy named Isaac. He's got two kids, Esau and Jacob. His wife's name is Rebecca. Just give you the very short version here real quick. Mama says, go in to daddy, tell him a lie. Still brother's birthright. Already sold, sold his birthright for the uh, pottage. You go get the uh, blessing of the firstborn. It all happens. Jacob has to run off. Finally comes back. Kissy face, kissy face. They all make up. Y'all all remember the story, right? How does that story play out if you're Isaac? Well, let's just ask a few questions. If you're Isaac... The day after all that goes down, how do you feel about it? No, at least we have one honest person in the room. If you're Isaac, the day after that happens, how do you feel about Esau? You feel sorry for Esau. How do you feel about Jacob? 
Probably not his, you're, he's probably not your favorite child at the moment, right? If you're Jacob, how are you feeling about yourself? Scared? Proud? Prideful? If you're Esau, how do you feel about your brother? Not a real happy. How do you feel about your mama? Yeah, how do you feel about your daddy? I mean, would you... And, and what I'm trying to get you to do, asking you these questions, is, look, when you read the Scripture, don't read it like it's just a fair... Don't read it like these are just characters that are so far removed from humanity. As you're reading these stories, read through that and ask yourself, what if I was... What would this story mean? If I was Jacob, what would this story mean to me? And when you do that, you begin to learn different stuff. And um, as you go look at this, if you really begin to do some study, the Jews called Jacob a man of truth. So for all of you in there, how many of you would say that Jews, Jacob was a man of truth? Anybody in this room? Uh, maybe, I don't know. We'll see in a minute. How many of you would say Jacob was a man of truth? To bring about a great... Absolutely. After God changed his name, he became that man of truth. Yeah. So let me ask you this question. If we go back and we look, and I wanted to read through all this tonight, but we won't read the whole story because I'd have to read five chapters. But, but as we go through this, if you remember, Rebecca got a word of prophecy. Whenever the two boys were inside of her and there was this war going on and she cried out to God and said, God, if, I, if this is by you, why is there such turmoil going on with inside of me? There was continually this tussle. And remember, God gave her a prophecy. The younger will rule the older and the older will serve the younger and on and on. And so let me ask you this question. Does Rebecca's prophecy that she received make what they did okay? I think she did. And I, think, and I also think that Isaac knew the prophecy, and then Jacob knew the prophecy, and I don't know about Esau, but I think they, they, that it had been told. I do. And so let me ask you this, another question. And um, out of whom was the deception born? Did Isaac create the deception? Did Rebecca create the deception? Who was the birther of the deception? All right, we're going to look at that in just a minute. There is so many angles in this story that we've got to pull up. That prophecy and... I, yo, I think that's a very real likelihood, almost definitely. Did she not see betrayal in this? Or did she think that, it, that God's word, that the promise of God was so important that whatever you could do to bring it about was okay? Just like Sarah trying to bring about a son and bringing in Hagar. You know, as you begin to look at that. So there's a lot of questions. And well, here's something I want to throw out there. This is a flashpoint in, in the old book, in the Old Testament. And you cannot understand this whole story. If you take just the prophecy for Rebecca and look at, make it stand by itself, you take the, the pottage of stew and you make it stand by itself, you take the, the deception and you make it stand by itself, you take Isaac, uh, excuse me, you take Jacob all the way over there uh, looking for a wife and all the years he spent and you make it stand by itself. If you don't pull all that together and take about five chapters and put it together, you'll never understand what this story's about. You'll get the idea that lying's okay, that helping God in the flesh is just wonderful, that it's all right to do whatever it takes to get ahead and to cheat is just fine. And that's not what any of this story tells us. And so there's been a lot of confusion about a lot of this, and so we're going to run through that. So you have to look at all of this and say, what is the punchline in the end? And uh, I want to throw this out there to you, just something for you to think about. Did you ever thought about this, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God said, I, you, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told you the other day, they're th they're, all three of these men, their greatest struggle was with their kids. Do you realize all three of this men had to give up a son? Abraham had to give up Ishmael, and he had to give up Isaac in symbol, right? Isaac has two sons, and they get in a tussle between of them, one of them, and he loses Jacob for 21 years. He has to lose a son. Jacob has a son that ends up trapped in Egypt and he thinks he's dead because he had a coat of many colors and it comes back to him torn and covered in blood. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all three of those men had to mourn the death, even symbolically, of a son. Where was their greatest promise? In their sons. Where was their greatest struggle? In their sons. Where did they have to pay the greatest cost? 
in their sons. Isn't that interesting that all three of them had to do that? Let me throw this out there to you as you're getting started. Something that every for good teaching, you cannot do what is illegitimate in an effort to bring about the legitimate. You need to write that down in your spiritual journal somewhere. You cannot, cannot, cannot do what is illegitimate in an effort to bring about the legitimate. It's extremely important that you understand that. You cannot, you cannot hide your tithe in your pocket in an effort to become prosperous. You cannot lie to the IRS in an effort to become prosperous. You cannot, do, you cannot do any illegitimate thing in an effort to receive or bring about what is legitimate. In other words, if you have a promise from God, if you have a prophecy from God, and you can see a way that you can bring it about by twisting, by turning, by doing anything in your flesh, your way, if I push this button, twist this knob, kick this leg right here, then this gold bar is going to fall out. Guess what? In the push, the turn, and the kick, you'll sin. And you'll take what was legitimate and make it illegitimate in your life because you cannot do what is illegitimate and ever get what is legitimate. I've got a lot of wrinkled foreheads and a lot of really quiet people thinking really hard right this second. So as we are going through uh, looking at this, let me point out a couple of things. It, Genesis chapter 25, let me bring this story down to a kind of a um, cliff note version. In Genesis chapter 25, we've got a miracle birth. You got identical twins. Four different times in this story, the Bible's going to say they were struggling. There was a prophecy about one over the other. Again, with identical twins, remember this, that identical twins share resources inside the womb. How many of you have ever noticed that oftentimes when you have identical twins, you'll have one strong, one weak, one larger, one smaller. Sometimes one will have health issues and one doesn't have health issues. Anybody ever notice that? Why is that? Because there was a struggle inside the womb for what we would call limited resources. Everybody say limited resources. The struggle over limited resources. One comes out red and hairy. He's healthy. He's well formed. He's wonderful. His daddy loves him. He walks first, talks first, shoots farther, runs faster, jumps higher. Is better in all those athletic ways. They, being Isaac and Rebecca, call this one Esau which means hands or the doer and provider. So Esau was a doer. He was a provider. He would go out and kill the meat and bring it in and dress it for daddy. He was a doer like daddy was. And then you had the other one. His name was Jacob. How, how many of you remember the story of the birth? Esau has come out. He's just been born. All of a sudden a hand shoots out. And what's that hand do? He grabs a hold of the heel of Esau. Instantly, he gets a name. From that day forward, Esau, hands, doer, provider, a great name for a young man. All of a sudden, Jacob, the hand shoots forward, grabs the brother by the heel, remember the prophecy. And instantly, his name becomes Jacob, which means the healer, H-E-E-L-E-R, not H-E-A-L-E-R, the healer, grabbing by the heel, and it means to be to be the healer, H-E-E-L-E-R, means to be crooked, to twist, to connive, to be, a, to be a debater. And Jacob was considered to be a man of the voice. He became very cunning. He was a talker. He was weaker than his brother. He stayed in the tent with his mom. He knew how to cook. He knew how to sew. He knew how to do all those things. Mother took him in. Daddy took Esau in. We have a difference between mama and daddy. And all of a sudden... Jacob becomes a man of cunning. He's wise. He knows how to twist and turn. He becomes a man of great cunning to make things happen his way. Isaac loves Esau because he's a doer. Mama loves Jacob because he's her houseboy. He, and by the way, Jacob hates his name. How many of you remember the story of how Jacob ends up with the birthright? Esau's out hunting. Esau's coming back in from hunting. Esau says, I am so starved to death, I'm about to die. Anybody ever wondered, what was Jacob doing sitting there cooking stew? I mean, I just don't make a habit of going out on the edge of the woods and starting up a campfire and cooking stew. What was he doing out there in the first place? He was waiting on Esau. 
Why was he waiting on Esau? Because how many times had he heard his brother come in after a long period of time hunting and he hasn't been able to kill anything and so famished and so hungry and just about to fall over and faint. And so Esau is out there hunting. Jacob goes out and pretty much has an idea where he's at. And so he cooks him up a fine pot of wonderful smelling stew. I wouldn't be surprised if he was standing there with a fan fanning the smell of the stew out into the woods. Esau comes along, very faint, about to die. And this, then now we have it. Jacob, yeah, you can have a pot, but I got something I want. What do you want? I want the birthright. You got to understand what birthright meant. Remember, in this society, the oldest son inherited everything. The oldest son was the one who carried the inheritance. Even all the way back in, down and through the Mosaic Law, the oldest son carried the inheritance. He inherited the land. He inherited the cattle. He inherited the servants. He inherited the money. He inherited everything. And so what Esau said was, I'm going to die anyway. What good is a birthright? What's good to a, a goat to a dead man? So, yeah, fine. You take the birthright, and I'll eat the stew. And just like that, Esau sells the birthright. Hates his birthright for, the, for a pot of stew. And we look at that. Go ahead, Anita. I think he, had a, I think he should have known what it, what it meant, number one. Number two, I think that he probably didn't really. And he cried over it later. Yes. And he sold it. Yeah, and it was, and it was that, they, they exchanged it. That was a gift exchange. That was a covenant they were cutting. And go ahead, Pop. That's right. Yes. Now watch this, cattle and certain hills, how we say it, some saw. He is infinitely rich, has given you eternal life, everything pertaining to life and to godliness. In this life and in the next life, he's made you a king and priest unto God. And Satan will sit there at the side of the woods and he will pop, go and cook up a pot of earthly pleasure and he'll fan the smell out into the woods and draw you right over to it. And he'll pick up a pot of pottage and he will say to you, I will sell you your birthright. And how many, sides. look at it and I'll get it back. He'll forget about that later. Daddy loves me best. There's really not death in that pot. And they take up the pot and they eat out of that pot. No, and they walk away from it not realizing that they just created a legal contract in the spirit realm for the wage of sin is death. And they just ingested into them a small thing with huge and lasting repercussions. And we look at Esau and we point a point finger at him and go boy you lost your mind you mean to tell me you couldn't walk 10 more steps to mama's tent and it got the same thing and we find ourselves at the exact same place at the with the exact same offer and we can't walk 10 more steps away from it and fall at the altar of God where we could have got the exact same that we find ourselves boat we surely do any other comments or questions Yes, there are two bowls of soup in that story, and Jacob cooked them both. There's two bowls of soup in the story, and one of them gets, got, uh, Esau eats one of them, Isaac eats the other one. Now, jumping on, kind of, kind of just continuing to run through, Genesis chapter 26, uh, you, and I, again, we're not reading all this, uh, all of this for essence of time, but 26, verse 34 and 35, when Esau was 40 years old, he took wives of Judith, the daughter of Berea, the Heatite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elion the Heatite, and they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. So we're beginning to see a pattern here, all of a sudden. Not only has Esau sold his birthright, but now he's gone outside the family lineage to marry. And Isaac and Rebekah, he's driving them out of their mind. Anybody in the room has got kids? You understand what I just read. Those of you who don't have kids, you may not understand so well. But sometimes your kids can do stuff that are a grief of mind. You wake up thinking, what are they doing? You go to bed thinking, what are they doing? And all day in between, you're thinking, what are they doing? You know, and, uh, and it can happen. And that's what we find here. Esau is not following a good path. Now, if you jump over to Genesis, then over to Genesis chapter 27, verse 1 through 46, we could read this. Uh, again, I don't want to read it all, but here's where Isaac's about to get the blessing. Uh, Isaac is old. He says to Esau, I'm about to die. But I want you to notice something. Interesting part of this story. Isaac says, I am about, I'm an old man. I'm going to die very soon, Esau. Go out and kill an, a, a, a venison. Cook it up for me. Bring it to me. And I'm going to go ahead and give you the blessing. 
How long did I just tell you that Jacob was gone? 21 years. Guess who was still alive when he got back? Isaac. Isaac. Isn't that interesting? Was Isaac really about to die? No, he wasn't. Was there only one deception taking place in this story? No, there wasn't. I believe this, this is just commentary, thus saith chat. I believe that Isaac loved Esau. He had a, had a heart for Esau, and he knew that Esau had lost the birthright. Even though it's 21 years later, he's still alive. He says to him in a secret moment, Son, go do this very quickly. Come back, and I will go ahead and give you the blessing because I believe he knew the prophecy of Rebekah, and he wanted to short-circuit the prophecy of Jacob serving or Esau serving Jacob and wanted to force Jacob to serve Esau and his the deception actually began with Isaac trying to short circuit the prophecy of God again a man trying to do what was illegitimate instead of what was legitimate isn't that interesting I don't think Isaac was about to lay down and die a man sick enough to about lay down and die generally Without medical care, you didn't find him still alive 21 years later. That's more than just a few days. So I think that is actually where the deception started. So anyway, as you're going through there, you'll find Rebecca said, Hey, I heard your father saying this. Bring me this game. So, brother, let's do this. Let's go ahead. We're going to kill this young lamb, and we're going to cook it up real quick. And I'm going to take the hair, and I'm going to put it on the back of your neck, and I'm going to put it on your arm, and you're going to go in and feed this to your daddy, and he's going to give you the blessing. Let me ask you a question. What are the odds this are going to work? I mean, look, I know he's red and hairy. I know Isaac's losing his eyesight. But really, we're going to take the skin off a dead lamb. We're going to put it on. We're going to make like a glove. He's going to rub it. Going to put it on the back of your neck. I mean, he's blind, but he's not stupid. What are even the odds that this was going to work? I mean, I, if I was Jacob, I'd be sitting there listening to mom going, <laughs> you've lost your mind. He's going to catch me in this, and we're all going to be in trouble. And I think that that act conversation did kind of take place. Jacob said, look, uh, Esau's red and hairy. I'm smooth skinned. My father's going to feel me. He's going to think I am a deceiver. What was his name? The cunning one. And he's been living his whole life hating this name under the shadow of this name. And what he says right here to his mother is, please don't make me fulfill my name. My father will look at me and say, that name belongs to you. It's stuck like it's supposed to. You're exactly what I thought you were this whole time. And I can see inside Jacob's heart this rending within him. I hate this name. Why do I have to do it this way? A struggle with inside his heart where this name is forced. He says, my father will fill me, he'll put a curse on me. And his mother says, let the curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go into him. And so they do exactly that. They cook the food. She makes, uh, makes, gets some clothes of Esau, puts them on him. So that way when, Esau, uh, when uh, Isaac smells Esau's clothes, he'll smell like an outer field instead of like the perfumed robes that, of the mother's house, on and on. So they put this elaborate scheme together. He goes in. Y'all know the story. Isaac says, you sound like Jacob. And he says, no, I'm Esau. Come here. And he fills his hand and Pulls him down like he's going to kiss him and smells his clothes and feels the nap of his neck. And he says, the voice is the voice of a deceiver. Because what does Jacob's name mean? The voice sounds like the voice of a deceiver. But it feels like and smells like Esau. And he gives him the Isaac. He goes into Isaac and says, I've brought you. Isaac immediately begins. What's happened? I want you to notice Isaac's countenance. And he says, I've he goes from mourning and he drops it and he, he doesn't rant and rave about Jacob. Horrible. He immediately accepts it. And I think in that, he, Isaac, said within himself, there was a prophecy for this. I got caught in my exception. I was trying to do something with this. And Jacob has gotten exactly what God said should have been. If Jacob had walked in as Esau was out there hunting and said, Father, 
and you know that he's supposed to be a legitimate thing illimitely had he done the legitimate could it have been done in such a way that he didn't have to leave his family and leave with his brother hating him and in our life where we've had promises of God promises in the word promises that he spoke to see and we've tried to make it work out in the flesh and we've really made a mess where if we'd have just done it right what could the end have? just in the idea of thinking along that way one more thing I want to point out before we go on any farther as you go down Jacob did this when it all got started Rebecca gets found out let the curse be. remember I asked you at the very beginning Rebecca then said Rebecca said I'll take the curse then when it was found out she blamed it on Jacob <laughs> it does put you in some deep thought here doesn't it so anyway I know I've rattled on a lot tonight we got to start a little late because I want to show you the video and all that I'll finish up Jacob uh next week a whole lot of it has to do with that right there I guarantee you. go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29 a lot of it in the in the blessings and the curse it ties a whole lot to a lot of that yeah let me remind you as we're leaving God is not a God of if I had could have done this or 